Pico Iyer, I cannot tell you how much I have been looking forward to this conversation and how honored I am that you would do this. Uh, I know we're on opposite sides of the globe. Welcome to the show. It's wonderful to meet you. I uh, can't wait to have the conversation. Thanks, Dan. No, I'm really, really pleased to be here. And I'm probably in exactly the place you want to be right now. <laughs> I think you're right. Springtime Japan. <laughs> I think you're right. I, I need to get back over there. I've been to Japan once and uh, it's, I'm overdue. But um I, I know we're going to talk a lot today about one of, you know, just selfishly one of my favorite books of all time, uh, A Beginner's Guide to Japan. I've got tons of notes, tons of quotes from the book prepared that I'm hoping to read out and get your thoughts on. But it probably helps for people who are listening to this, who are watching this, uh, just to get a your story as to how you ended up as a fly on the wall in Japan for the decades that you have. What What is the the genesis of that, what's the, how do you make sense of how you ended up in such a foreign land? <laughs> I can't make too much sense of it, <laughs> but it's a curious tale. And I think one that most of your listeners can probably relate to. So in 1983, I was working in Midtown Manhattan for Time Magazine, uh, 26 years old, and I had a business trip in Hong Kong. And flying back from Hong Kong to JFK, I had a one night layover in Narita Airport near Tokyo. And this is the last place I wanted to be. I just wanted to get back home quickly and tell all my friends about Hong Kong. But there I was, uh, stuck in the airport hotel. And I went to sleep and I woke up and I went to breakfast and I still had four hours to kill before check-in. And I saw this little sign in the hotel lobby offering a free shuttle bus to the town of Narita. And I thought, you know, I know airport towns, I know Inglewood and Queens and Hounslow, they're not the most uh, transfixing cultural centers on the planet, but I'll probably never be in, in Japan again and I've got nothing else to do. So I got into this little shuttle van and it took me through very built up Western looking concrete high rise filled area. And then we came to a bridge. And I went across the bridge, and suddenly I was in this very small, intimate area, mostly wooden houses uh, with tatami mats and shoes laid out perfectly at the entrance. And through the back of the windows in these tea rooms and restaurants, I could see the first flashes of red and, and gold from the coming autumn. And I followed this little riddle of lanes, and then I came to a huge white pebble courtyard with a big wooden mm, temple at the other end. And of course, I'd never seen a Buddhist temple of this kind before. So I went and, and sat there for a while. And then I came out and I followed a pile of gravestones out to the temple garden. And this was a late October day, uh, which means in Japan, blazing blue skies, but the first just pang of autumn in, in the air. And this lovely mix of kind of exuberance and wistfulness. I love the autumn, especially in Japan. And there were a group of little kids in pink and blue hats, probably kindergartners, who were scattering across the lawn of the temple garden, uh, gathering autumn leaves. And honestly, I couldn't tell you why, but something in that scene felt so familiar. Mm. I thought, I know this place, and this place knows me. And if I don't come back here, I'll be in exile all my life. Something will always be unresolved inside me. And so literally, by the time I boarded my plane back to New York City, you know, two hours later, I decided to move to Japan on the basis of four hours in an airport town and an unwanted layover. And it took me three years to um, extricate myself from my job, but finally I did. And I came to Japan and I've been here 35 years now. And I would gladly spend every minute of the rest mm -hmm. of my life here. And I think one thing that always strikes me when I think back about that moment mm -hmm. is I'm guessing everybody has some place that's really special to him or her. And if you're very lucky, you find that place at a relatively young age. And if you're even luckier, thanks to technology, you actually find a way um, to live in the place that feels like your secret deepest home. So that's where I am now and pure chance, really. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. And do you, you know, that, that kind of internal experience that triggered this complete about face in your life, do you view that as intuition mostly? How do you how do you think about that moment where you, as you said, you've got this big life in New York City, you weren't even necessarily planning on exploring Japan whatsoever. Do you, do you feel that was just sort of a calling for you? How do you make sense of that? Exactly. I, I think you put it perfectly, Dan. A, a, a calling, intuition, some mysterious affinity that I couldn't make sense of. Just the way that, you know, sometimes you'll walk into a crowded room with strangers and you'll see somebody and you feel you've known her forever mm -hmm. and that you know her better than your friends and family. And I think we have that same relation with certain places near and far to us. 
Um, at later, you know, I could give you lots of explanations why it made sense for me to be in Japan. It's like an exotic version of the England where I grew up in the scale and the, the way the neighborhoods and the hierarchy works very similar, but I don't think you can really offer reasons. So when I, when I told my mother, I was moving to Japan, she just rolled her eyes and she says, you must have been Japanese in a past life. And, and she did remember how even as a little boy, I would see a Japanese woodcut in, in a museum or I'd read a Japanese poem and it would go right through me there already i felt some connection so it's probably just a matter of circumstances finally getting me to japan and then probably the moment of recognition would come quickly later you know i found out that narita where the airport is is in fact home it's a great pilgrimage center the temple i'd visited is a thousand years old and people used to walk 46 miles from central tokyo to be there so in fact um although it's so close to the big international airport it is already a rather um, sacred, ancient, powerful place. But I knew none of, none of that when I stumbled around it. Well, it's a gift for all of us that you've spent so long there because of how fascinating your book is. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned this, I've been to Japan once for just a few weeks, but this book provides, I think, such a brilliant insight from, again, from an outsider's perspective, from a Western perspective of from a writer's mind, these deep, fascinating insights that you have gleaned over the years about Japan and what what that country really means. And I think part of the appeal, I'm American, to people who are from places like the US is, and you write about this in the book, how foreign Japan is. It's a first world country, but it is like going to a different planet. And I know we're going to talk a lot about the book today. And I thought what might be helpful, there are way too many um, you know, quotes from the book that I would love to talk to you about to fit into this hour. But there are a few that I'd love to read and then a specific few that I would love to get your, your thoughts on, which I found the ones especially that I want to talk to you about so concise and deep and profoundly interesting. And so maybe we can just start with a few of the the quotes from the book that I don't know when the last time was that you reread it. Um, but so many is just, I come back to as being profoundly insightful about the place that you have called home for 35 years. I want to read just a, a few. I, I, I'd love that. And and you're absolutely right. I Even though I've been here 35 years, it still feels like a foreign planet to me, which is wonderful because that's what makes it fascinating. As you say, nothing that I brought with me from the US begins to compute here. And I never feel I can get to the bottom of it, which is why I choose to live here on a, on a tourist visa. Um, and although I spent time in China and South Korea and other of the neighboring countries, nowhere is so distant as Japan. So yeah, fire away, please. I've, <laughs> I've heard you say exactly that in prior interviews. And I, I remember telling my my family when I got back from being in Japan that it felt to me like an introvert's paradise. And so many of the quotes that you mm. remark upon in the book, I think, are related to that mm. kind of insight about the place. So here, here are a few. And I, some of these are hilarious, too, that I just find so deeply funny. The people, are, all, the people around you on a Japanese train are often strikingly poker-faced and self-erasing. Yet the cartoon figures in the books they're carrying have bulging eyes and sport blaring colors. Their ejaculations delivered in block capital rife with exclamation points, the equivalent of pow and zap and wow. This is another one. The ultimate convenience is, of course, uniformity. Every convenience store looks like every other. When I rent a car abroad, I always request a Japanese car. Because a Nissan, a Honda, a Toyota all function in exactly the same way. Their controls virtually indistinguishable. Here's another one. Japan has a sharp edge sense of what can be perfected. Gizmos, surfaces, manners, and of what cannot. Morals, emotions, families. Thus, it's more nearly perfect on the surface than any country I've met in part because it's less afflicted by the sense that feelings, relationships, or people can ever be made perfect. I thought that was so brilliant. And there's a, there's a, a few themes I, that you touch on in this book that I would love to get your thoughts on. And I, I think it's fairly well known in the US about the minimalistic aspect of Japanese design sense and the idea in a world of 
and I, I so identify with this as an American of people constantly attempting to add more and more to their life of subtraction and the theme of subtraction. And this is a line from the book I would love to get your your take on. And this is this is the quote. In much the same spirit, the Japanese aesthetic is less about accumulation than subtraction, so that whatever remains is everything. Any thoughts on that quote? I know it's been a long time since you wrote those words, but I, I do think that is such a deeply in, insightful aspect of, I think, what is Japanese and probably in many ways what people find so peaceful about that country in general. Yeah, well, there's too much um, I could say about it. But <laughs> the easiest way to begin is, you know, my parents are both from India, which has a very rich, cluttered aesthetic. When I go into my uncle's room, there are more statues and paintings than I know what to do with. Mm. When I go into a classical room here in, in Nara or Kyoto, usually nothing there, absolute emptiness, and one scroll and one vase. And because there's nothing there, you bring all your attention to that scroll in your vase and the vase, and you find the whole universe there. Mm -hmm. And and as you said, it's very relaxing. It's liberating. In a world of information overload, it's a real relief to have underload, to, to, to be able to bring your attention to everything. And I think that's part of the reason why, even in a convenience store, the service is so perfect. And I think because most visitors are almost shocked that you'll go into a 7-Eleven in Japan, which is already one of the safest places around, unlike in the US, and there'll be somebody in cargo pants and kind of wrappers clothes, Japanese. and they bring all their attention to you as if you're the emperor himself. You're, they're just giving you a bag of French fries, but they'll cup it into cup it in their hands and hand over your your change, and it's as if they're giving you a priceless gift. Mm -hmm. And that, as you experience, suffuses every aspect of Japan. In terms of the minimalism, you're right. I, people often talk about the, about the Japanese economy, and I think the real important economy is they're very economical with words and very economical with facial expressions. And it's a way of not complicating life and not intruding on others. And I think maybe I say somewhere else in that book, if I'm sitting in my apartment where I am right now, and I hear a woman talking outside, I sometimes sometimes can't tell if it's my wife or a stranger. And I've been with my wife 35 years. But that's a function of you know, the quotes that you are reading, that everybody tries to speak more or less in the same tone of voice, using the same words. And to us, as you said, I think, or suggested, coming from the US, it's a shock, because we're so wed to our individuality. We want to put our own stamp on everything. But the Japanese feel that... Um, it's, it's, it's a kindness to everybody not to disrupt your day or to add extra drama to your to day, but to be sort of when you meet a grandmother, she's just the perfect platonic ideal of a grandmother, which is wonderful. You don't there's none of the static of um, individual you know, complaint or, or, or whatever. So it, it introverts paradise is a beautiful way of putting of it. it. I've never thought of it before, but when I was in New York City contemplating my move to Kyoto, I did think it's the most contemplative, quiet place that I know. And so it's another way of saying introverts paradise with a great sense of privacy. And the other thing I'm sure you experience, which everyone does when what they come to Japan, is you're in a very, very crowded subway car and it's absolutely silent. Or when I take the flight over from San Francisco to Osaka, as I'll be doing two weeks from now when I return to California, it's a full plane and you barely hear a voice raised throughout 11 hours. And there's no other country in the world that has that sense of self-containment, which I think speaks for great respect for others. People don't want to intrude. You know, I, I spend the rest of my life in California. And when I go there and buy some French fries, the person selling the French fries often wants to tell me about the breakup with her boyfriend and everything that's going on in her life, even though she's a complete stranger, which is a nice sort of openness, but it's more than I can handle often in my busy day. Whereas in Japan, I know that's never going to happen. <laughs> totally. But yeah, and I, yeah. you, you, you remarked about this, that you, I mean, that story perfectly encapsulates what, uh, you know, the, some of the differences I think are culturally between the two places. And I'm wondering if eventually the West will take a page out of the playbook from the Japanese and learn a bit more of the, the value of silence and the value of subtraction, the value of less choice rather than more. And I'd be curious to know if, if it's affected you in that way. Is that something that you notice, you know, that you have changed as a formerly, you know, English slash American resident to living in Japan? Are you more mindful about what you purchase, what you add to your life, a little bit more apt to, to remove things? So 
in, uh, to begin with the beginning of your question, you're absolutely right, because I think most people I know everywhere in the world are feeling more cluttered, more distracted, more bombarded, even with data as well as physical stuff. And so you're right. I think there's more and more of the aesthetic of the sushi bar, whether you're in Paris or Santa Monica. That's what's relaxing. And I noticed luxury hotels now are uh, more and more minimalist. It used to be you'd go into a fancy hotel and there was chandeliers and gilt and tapestries, and now you go into a fancy hotel – there's nothing there except maybe yeah. a glass cube and a, a single rose because they know that's what's most re relaxing and, and liberating for a, a tired guest. So I do think those qualities are more and more in demand everywhere in the world. And as you said a few minutes ago, that's why we all know about the Japanese aesthetic and Marie Kondo is busy telling us how to be better minimalists on, on TV. I think at a deeper level, though, um, I'm not sure how much we're going to change. And when I first arrived in Japan, my first year here, I wrote a book called The Lady and the Monk about meeting my Japanese wife. So I was so excited coming from the US to come to this place of great calm and order and inwardness. And she, who's the same age as I, was desperate to leave Japan because she wanted freedom and possibility and open spaces and everything she associated with California. And so I think if you ask the Japanese person, they would be wise to the, the graces and beauties of a different kind of aesthetic is they've had plenty of minimalism and they're keen to get more of everything, especially Japanese women who have relatively constrained opportunities. Uh, in terms of myself, I did come over here because I thought it would be an antidote to what I grew up with in Britain and the US. And I thought I'd really been trained to speak a lot. And in Japan, I could learn to listen. And as we were saying, I'd really been trained to push myself forwards. And in Japan, I could be pretty much invisible. Mm. And I'd really been trained, I think, to think about myself and decorating my my resume. And in Japan, I thought it'd be a really good thing to learn about being part of a community and defining myself in terms of some much larger whole as, as Japanese and I think East Asian people tend to do um, naturally. And so one thing I notice after many years here is that when I walk down the street in Japan, <laughs> if I see some trash, I reflexively bend down to pick it up. I never would have done that in New York. And if I tried to do it in New York, I'd never have got to the end of the street. There'd be so much trash. But it's a sign of that being here for a long time, I've developed, I suppose, a slightly bigger sense of responsibility to the community around me than I would have had otherwise. So right across the street from where I'm talking to is our bus stop. And when you get off the bus here, there's literally a map showing the, the names of every single family in the neighborhood and where the houses are. Mm which would be anathema, I think, in, in California. But the thought is we're all part of the same unit. We're all responsible for everybody else's kids. And people want to know where the Fujitas are and where the Takeuchis are and how you stand within this web. Whereas I think where my mother used to live in California is very, very isolated. And she's been there 50 years. We've never even met our neighbors. So everything about it is different. And for us, I think it's a really exciting possibility. For many of the Japanese, the American model is what's most appealing to them. <laughs> totally. I want to get back to the book and read read a few few more lines from the book. Um and and some of the you know your um observations and memories from the book I I I will have here. And so we'll be talking about that I think here shortly. Here's another quote from the book. In war, the Japanese readiness to follow every order to the last degree and beyond can make its people as brutal and as ed and inhuman as in the 7-Eleven, they're un unendingly sweet and obliging. Mm. Here's another one. Even modest restaurants in Japan offer uh, often present you with a prefix menu. Freedom doesn't mean an abundance of choice so much as liberation from the burden of too much choice, something we already talked about. Mm. Here's another one. But it was something, I love this one, but it was something deeper and more heartening that made West Point, the United States Military Academy, feel unexpectedly like home. A perfect translation of the life I know in Japan. The courtesy, the sense of order, held up by an unbudging sense of hierarchy, the devotion to tradition, and most of all, the everyday humanity. People weren't spinning off in different directions here, lost in their own plans or orbits. They were brought together into a unit, a sense of fellowship and community that spoke for a commitment to something larger than themselves. Mm. 
Um, the quote I want to read and get your thoughts on is, is a fact about Japan that I've talked to many friends about, which is just mind blowing when you hear about these truths and the, you know, or watch news episodes about what is going on here. And I, I termed this theme like real life cosplay. And this is the quote, <laughs> the company family romance employs 1400 actors to pretend to be a, to, to be family members for clients who are going through hard times. Its boss has acted as a husband to 100 women <laughs> and as a young girl's father for months on end. One of his workers played a wife to one man for seven years. Another such company, Support One, sends actors to offer apologies on a client's behalf, to pretend to be a betrayed wife, to act as an inconsolable friend. I remember learning about family romance a few years ago, I think when I was living in San Francisco and not believing that this was real. And I don't know if you have any additional experience with this you know, business or if, if it's even still around, but this was something I had to get your, your take on as to what it says about Japan as a country, as a culture, that this kind of, uh, this kind of cosplay, this business family romance exists in the first place. What, what, do, you, what do you make of that in general? Well, as one of your earlier quotes that you read out suggested, people are playing roles here, and mm. that's a form of, of kindness, and that's what they're supposed to do in, in public. And so there's this natural suspension of disbelief. When I see, uh, when I go to the bakery across the street, the old lady there is always amazingly kind to me. And she's mm. probably got a lot of stress in her life. She may be sick. She may be unhappy to see me, but she's always kind and 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 I'm so grateful for her playing that part. So I think of family romance as just an extension of of this. Um Werner Herzog you may know actually made a movie about this a few mm -hmm. years ago. And the example I always think of is that famously there's a big aging problem in Japan and the family is beginning to splinter more than it used to. And so many an older couple don't have um, a, a daughter who will look in on them. And so on Sundays, they will hire a young woman to come and visit, knock on the door at noon and open when they open the door. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. I'm so happy to see you. And it's been a long time. And how are you doing? And is there anything I can do for you? And, you know, please tell me if there's anything you need in the course of the week. And they suspend their disbelief, figuring even a pretend daughter who's playing her part immaculately is better than loneliness or mm. absence. So it's a very practical way of thinking things and as uh, thinking about things. And as you say, it's it's hard for us to to figure out that that kind of leap. But in, in Japan it, it it seems natural because when you meet somebody, you don't figure you're getting that real person. You figure you're meeting the role and she's playing whatever the part has to be, whether it's a shopkeeper or a fellow passenger on a crowded train or um, a, 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 a stranger next to you at the concert. Um, but uh, we always feel that we have to be ourselves. And I think mm. the Japanese feel that they need to be not themselves. And that's what, because they're context specific and that's what the occasion calls for. Mm. Um so, you know, given that there is a lot of loneliness everywhere in the world, anything that can serve to ease that, I think, is is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, and you know, again, the the contrast between between our culture and their culture, really, your culture now is is just so stark. And you're right; I think we are as Americans as I think this is true, and maybe to a lesser degree, but certainly in the U.S., certainly in California, are raised and encouraged to be your authentic self, to share your feelings, to be um, fairly transparent with your inner state. And I know you've experienced both worlds a lot for many, many years. And I'd be curious to get your take on if you think there's a a better way, you know, that you were just talking about how grateful you are for the the woman who you interact with consistently, who is able to generate kindness despite what is almost certainly the going on in her life and the hardships that are going on in her life how do you think about which of the two are the better way for you know a person or a culture to um prevailingly encourage to to uh, exhibit on a consistent basis <laughs> 
Well, this it's a really good question. And it hit me very, very hard during the pandemic because I was actually going back and forth every few weeks mm -hmm. between California and Japan. And I should say, everything in Japan continued absolutely as normal. Uh, throughout the pandemic. To this day, everybody is masked all the time, 100% of the time, even when they're walking outside a lonely park. But uh, people here assume that life is going to be difficult. So they weren't shocked or thrown out when the, suddenly there was lockdown and they were unable to unable to, to fly out of the country as they had been. Everyone went to work. All the kids went to school. The government announced a state of emergency, but in fact, the state of emergency was the way was state of norm normalcy, everything mm -hmm. exactly the same. And every time I flew back to Los Angeles airport, I felt I was entering this cauldron of panic and rage and confusion. And people seemed very upset about the pandemic, as if it was an insult or an aberration, mm -hmm. or why has this thing suddenly come along to topple our lives and overthrow all our plans? And Everyone was, again, sort of expressing emotions in a different way, often clashingly, uh, each person venting his or her own frustrations or anxieties, perhaps. Um, and it it was a very clamorous and not such a uh, comforting place to be when I whenever I returned to California. And it reminded me of how many people will remember during the terrible tsunami and earthquake here in Japan in 2011. I think what really shocked the world was in the wake of the tsunami on TV, you would see long lines of Japanese lined up absolutely silent, mm. uncomplaining, just quietly waiting to, to be given food or, or shelter. And I don't think you'd quite see that anywhere else in the world. And I'm guessing what those people were thinking about after the terrible loss is each woman realized, even though she had perhaps lost her own children and her husband, everybody there had lost as much or maybe mm. even more. So if she were to vent her grief, that would only aggravate the grief of people who are already suffering a huge amount. And so mm. the kind, thoughtful thing to do in a community where everybody is suffering is to try to keep your suffering to yourself. And I know that a lot of people in the United States or in the West would powerfully say that's a form of repression or that's not a healthy response. And they might have good reasons for saying that. But for me, I'm happier to be in a calm environment where people are not pursuing happiness, but knowing that life is going to be difficult. And and they have this wonderful phrase here about joyful participation in a world of sorrows. I think it's kind of a Buddhist idea. They know life is always going to be difficult. There'll always be sickness and old age and death, but that doesn't preclude joy and it doesn't preclude calm and contentment. Um, and given when there's a war, when there's a pandemic, um, it, it, it's refreshing to be in a place where mm. everybody isn't um, in a state of, of, of fury or unsettleness. Just before we forget about um, family romance, I mm. should say that I think we in the West, and I, I still think of myself pretty much as a Westerner, mm. um, w in certain circumstances, we suspend disbelief in exactly the same way. I've spent a lot of time in Thailand and the Philippines, and I know that many, many Western men will go there and they'll, as it were, hire a girl from the bar and they'll have the girlfriend experience and they will believe she loves me. Mm -hmm. This is the first love I've ever had. She's really here because I'm such an attractive person. And in fact, they're doing exactly the same as the customers of family romance. They're basically hiring a, a sweetheart. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're prepared to, to pretend in those circumstances, oh, this is a real relationship. So, you know, we're, we're susceptible to the same impulses, but we don't extend it to the family context so much, but mostly I think only to romance. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, your comment there about, you know, the experience of the, and behavior of the Japanese after the uh, Fukushima and during the pandemic, I, and I'd never really put this together before, but it is a stoicism of sorts. It's a considerateness right. of, yes. of other people. And, and there absolutely seems like there is a, something to be learned in our culture from from that kind of you know grace and um and dignity in the face of of struggle I, i'd be curious to know in your experience if you find if there is any outlet you know with a best friend with a you know in a very healthy relationship or marriage where people feel like they have a license to be their actual selves to to vent a little bit to um share their actual you know enduring feelings or does that just typically not really exist in that culture? 
It does exist, and 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 just as you would imagine, it does happen between close friends, and mm. certainly in a in a marriage. So, you know, I've I've been with my wife, as I say, for thirty five years, and I'm never in doubt of her feelings or if she's upset or frustrated. Yesterday, she was going to see two old school friends of hers, whom she's known since she was seventeen, and I think they would ex- share confidences just as much as any old friends anywhere in the world. But you're right that the demarcation comes very in a different point and much further on in, in a relationship in Japan than in the West. And I remember when I first met my wife, um, and of course, like anybody, I'm really difficult in many ways to be with. And she said to me early on, well, Pico, you're impossible in all these ways, so I have to change myself, Hiroko. I said, wait a minute, you don't want to change me? She said, no, you are who you are. I can't change you, so I'm going to have to change to adapt to who you are. Mm. Um, for example, she's a night owl and I go mm. to bed very early. So she actually goes to bed very early now and wakes mm. up very early. And so I was so moved by this that I wanted to do the same in return with her and decide, well, there's no changing her and the parts of her that are difficult. I'm going to have to make the adjustment within. And so that's a fundamental difference too, I think. Mm. Um, and you're right about the stoicism. I know, I think in the West, there's a the sense that the more you share with somebody, the closer you are. Hmm. Whereas here, I don't think there's that assumption because not sharing is is a form of kindness and and thoughtfulness um, in many cases. Uh, and as as you, your question suggests, with somebody you really know well, you share as much as possible. But um, so many people in our lives are, are acquaintances, or we're not really going to spend so much time with, and there's no need really to inflict a lot of things on them. And I think basically during the pandemic, what hit me was. I was going back and forth between a very young culture and a very old culture. So Japan for 1400 years has been dealing with warfare <laughs> and typhoons and tsunamis and forest fires. And so it's it's used to that. And the California, where I spend time in the US, is very young, fresh place, which is why it's so enticing to many of my Japanese friends. But it's less equipped to deal with challenge, I think, because it's 200 years of history, maybe. Yeah, you know, they've been dealing with all of those things for fourteen hundred years, and they've been dealing with human nature for fourteen hundred years. Exactly. Well and, said, precisely. And and we, I, I think that's a it's a really important point is the the difference in the age of the two countries and how, in many ways, arguably, America is the the even still kind of the infant on the world stage, or at least the teenager that maybe is thinking they can have it all and um, has a propensity to try to find utopia or find perfection. Um, which can be a very difficult and disappointing endeavor if that's something that you're trying to achieve in this world. Um, yes, I mean, the pursuit yeah. of happiness is difficult because I think we, happiness only comes when it's not sought, essentially. We all know it comes of its own accord. And of the sentences you've read um, so far, the one about perfection was the one that really struck me. And I oh, yeah, I'd forgotten I'd written that, but... but um, I agree with it. And I remember, I mean, the fir- almost the first month of the new millennium, so January 2000, I did write an essay for Time magazine about the world being divided between the old cultures and the new. Mm-hmm. And I think most of the old cultures admire and maybe envy the US for freshness, a strong sense of the future, energy, all the qualities we associate with with youth. But they also think a 16-year-old shouldn't think he knows it all. And a 16-year-old probably does have something to know from his grandfather, even though he also has certain good qualities that the grandfather might envy. Yeah, very well put. Here are a few more I, I want to read out. And um, this this is one. I, I love this one. In the gap between obedience and acquiescence, in fact, I means I'll do it, not I agree with it lies much of the bewildering brutality of the Japanese in war and the never-ending question of how much, for example, the wartime emperor was complicit in his country's aggression, how much just unable to say no. Here's another one. In England, Japan's Western cousin, I learned that the ultimate sign of intimacy is not all you can say to a friend, but all you don't need to say. And this is related to one of my all-time favorite movies. One sign that Sofia Coppola's Lost in Translation is a Japanese movie is the fact that the audience never hears its last and presumably most important sentence. <laughs> I thought that was a brilliant observation about that film. It's so true. <laughs> this is um, this is a quote I'd love to get your thoughts on. And the theme of this is is women. And you've, you've discussed this a little bit already during the conversation. 
Uh, but here's the quote, and then I'd love to get your thoughts. There are actually a few quotes because I thought these all were kind of related to women in Japan and, and just very important uh, observations about the, the state of women in the country right now. This is the first one. No one, no one married to a Japanese would ever call her repressed. She simply has a sharp and unwavering sense of where emotion is appropriate and where not. She lives in the gap the British classicist Jasper Griffin explained to his friend Ved Meta between denying one's emotions and choosing not to indulge them. Here's another one. In a survey conducted in 2014, nine in every 10 young Japanese women said that remaining single was preferable to what they imagined marriage to be. And here's the third one. Thus, women in Japan have every reason to make contact with a foreign world. You alluded to this earlier. By going abroad, by learning another language, even by marrying a foreigner. And men in Japan have every incentive to remain in a system that flatters and protects them. You've been there a long time. You've been married to a Japanese woman for a long time. Any follow-up on that? Any additional thoughts about the state of of women in that country? I mean, to me, it, just in the very little I know about Japan, it seems like it really is the arguably the the biggest uh, pa- remaining patriarchal society in the first world. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that, but I'd love to get any follow-up you have to those quotes and just the subject of women in Japan in your experience. Yes. And I think it goes back to um, the quote uh, about West Point you read a few minutes ago. And when I was listening to you read that, I was thinking that in many ways, um, Japan, I think, corresponds to the US in the 1950s, which has kind of a bad rap in the US now, but seemed like an orderly, family-centered, quite disciplined, gracious place. The men always wore um, (laughs) jackets and and ties. The women were taking care of the house. And things went along fairly smooth lines. Um, And some of Japan's stability, I think, is is like the way it used to be in America Um, and and sort of old-fashioned values, you could say. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is exactly what you're describing, which is, I think, when it comes to dealing with people outside the norm, so to speak, if it's a LGBT community or foreigners or even women, Japan is far behind every developed country. And I entirely agree with you. Um, I, I think in, in in the patriarchal stakes, I'm not sure where it is in relation to South Korea or China, but next to anywhere in the West, it's way behind. And when I first arrived here, as I say, my first year, 1988, I wrote a book about essentially the state of women in, in Japan. And 34 years on, it really hasn't evolved at all. And that's why more and more Japanese, as in that quote, are are defecting. Because in my experience, Japanese women are extremely energetic, bright, efficient, responsible, full full of remarkable qualities that have no outlet. In the Japanese public system, um, if you if you're the number one graduate from the University of Tokyo, the, the best university in this country, and you're a woman, you'll probably have to spend your whole life making tea, um, and, and it's just non non negotiable. And it also speaks to that interesting quote you read about acquiescence. One reason I choose not I choose to live on a tourist visa here, and I've never worked in Japan, is all the things I love about Japan might be quite frustrating if I was trying to meet it in a business context where you don't know the difference between a yes or a no, (laughs) because Mm -hmm. they'll never say no, but that doesn't actually mean yes. And my friends who are trying to negotiate in Tokyo have a really, really hard time. So that's something um, separate. But uh, it's when I think about the women in Japan, what comes to my mind, and and actually foreigners in Japan too, because I'm dark-skinned, as you can see, in the 1990s, every time I flew back into Osaka, maybe four times a year, <laughs> they would strip search me at customs. I looked like exactly the kind of person they didn't want to see coming into the country. They didn't know if I was a terrorist or Saddam Hussein's cousin or an Iranian trying to migrate illegally. But whatever I was, they weren't so happy to see me. Though as soon as I got through customs, everybody was flawlessly polite for the next three months. Uh, and I remember one time I was flying in again from Hong Kong, and there was and somebody else there from India of Indian background. And I said to him, does this happen to you when you arrive at customs? And he looked at me as if I were a kindergarten and said, no, because if you get to the customs hall and there are 14 lanes and 30 of them are manned by men, and there's a woman in the 14th, go to the woman. 
<laughs> and I followed his advice, and I have ever since. And it's true that the female customs officers are actually very sympathetic to foreigners. Welcome to Japan. Please come on in. Whereas the men are unsettled by us and kind of stand you near know, there. They're not so happy to see intruders arriving. So there is a marked difference, I would say, in how a foreigner is treated by a woman in Japan versus by a man in Japan. Yeah. And what is that? simply related to in your mind exactly what we've talked about before the role of duty the role of playing your expected role and that yes. you know the the movements in our country in the last in america in the last 70 years the the you know the women's movement it just it, you know the the dna the the tinder doesn't really exist in the same way in that in japan to create a kind of you know, minor cultural revolution for half of the population. And it ha is, does that make sense to you or is it something else? Makes absolute sense. Cultural revolution, I don't think translates into Japanese. And I think for certain good reasons, because the Japanese figure, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And their culture has done very well economically and mm -hmm. in terms of harmony and socially and so many other ways. And if you look at a lot of statistics, um, Japan is far ahead of the rest of the world um, in terms of safety and many other things and average state uh, standard of living. So they're not inclined. Um, to change, and they're very slow to change. And I think in a global world that's left them far behind, I'm still shocked. I think I probably mentioned it in the book. Out of 30 countries in Asia, in terms of command of English, Japan is 29th. Mm -hmm. It's below Afghanistan and Cambodia and Nepal and Indonesia and all these re much more impoverished places with much less developed educational systems. So it's just some kind of block. Mm -hmm. And I think Japan is paying the costs for that in terms of economy but culturally it's wonderful because it's entirely japanese and even though as you said at the outset the surfaces look american it's just as japanese as um as it always was so i you're right i don't think there's going to be a cultural revolution though individuals are seceding in just the way we were describing women joining foreign companies or marrying marrying foreigners and, and getting out. It, it is changing slowly. And I think men in their 30s in Japan are much more like men in their 30s in the West. They, they spend more time with their kids. They're more gentle. They understand that they have to parent as much as their wife does. And so that part is getting better. But still, when I met my wife, a Japanese wife's position was to walk two steps behind her husband and really almost never to talk to him. Um, and of course, n not many women would want to sign on to that, especially yeah. if there's an alternative. Um, not that foreign husbands are necessarily so good, but on the surface, <laughs> they're offering more opportunities than a Japanese husband traditionally. Yeah. Do you sense a sense of simmering resentment among the women you have gotten to know well in Japan that they, while they are willing and they go along with playing the role that there's a you know there are deep scars there there are people who are you know humiliated by the the expectation of their roles or is that really not not a thing i i don't think it is a thing i don't think resentment um is a japanese <laughs> feeling that i'm aware of very often let alone simmering resentment i think again their very practical response to life and all the challenges is adjust to it and make the most of it and i think you know i shouldn't speak for japanese women not being one but from what i hear from my wife and all her many close female friends they actually think oh actually we've got it good we don't have to go to the office every day uh we don't have the burden of never seeing our kids and coming back at midnight and then going off at six in the morning in our jackets and ties let's make the most of the first so this the system is excluding us from many other things but let's turn that to advantage by seeing the things that it allows us to do in their absence so rather than missing the things they can't do they're relishing the things that they can and so i don't think there's so much resentment mm. but just at the same time as just as you said perfectly there isn't so much change i think china and south korea which coming from the same sort of confucian backgrounds are changing much more quickly and i think women have much more opportunities there than in in japan but uh, mm. i haven't i haven't run into resentment at all mm. fascinating Let's get back to the book and I'll read a, a few more and then have one that I would love to get your your thoughts on. And you alluded to this exact quote earlier in the conversation. So I, I know you will know this as soon as I read it, but uh, I, it's worth reading out in full so that um, you get an accurate picture of exactly what you were saying in the book. This is about your wife. Soon after I came to know her, my wife-to-be said, I can't change you, so I have to change myself. Since you're, 
since you're in many ways not so easy. <laughs> <laughs> I was so disarmed by the spirit of accommodation that I tried to do the same with her, changing myself to adapt to everything in her that was difficult. Thus, the history of Japan. Here's another one. Read the classic poems of Kyoto and you see that a night of love is less important than the way one anticipates it or the words with which one commemorates it. What we do with our feelings lasts longer than the feelings themselves. And here's a third one that I, I thought was so interesting as well. In traditional Japan, it was considered discourteous for a man to be too friendly to a woman because that suggested in the division of responsibilities that she was a worker in the quote pleasure quarters and this is a theme that i you know i want to get your thoughts on we've talked about women and and the theme of this quote i think is related to patriarchy which we've mentioned but also men and women in the culture and the dynamic between the sexes in japan and this is the quote the year after I arrived in Japan, a Japan Times survey found that seven in 10 Japanese men refused even to consider working for a woman. We've you know, touched on this already directly, but, and maybe I already know the answer to your question with this, but it seems like not much has really changed in that capacity. And maybe it just is worth me asking you about the state of women in professional work in Japan right now. And you just mentioned this, that a woman who... I remember the story from a book I read uh, a while ago about the 1950s as it related to women in America. And you said that that's arguably where Japan is right now. It was a story about Sandra Day O'Connor when she graduated from Stanford Law School in the 50s. And her primary offering for a profession after graduating from Stanford, this is a future Supreme Court justice, was as a secretary in a law firm. And you mentioned that if you're a female in Japan graduating from their top university, you know you may be offered the ability to sell tea. Um, is there anything else to add there? What is the state of you know ambitious and intelligent, driven women in that culture? Is it a mentality generally of I'll go to university, I'll get educated, but you know once I get married, once I hit a certain age, I know the life of the intellect, the life of industry is not really going to be for me. What else is there to be said about women in the work in the workforce right now in Japan? Well, I think one of those sentences you just read out included something like the spirit of accommodation, which yeah. is why there is so much re resentment. And I think people, I, as I understand it in Japan, are very good at accommodating to realities and to circumstances. Um, so sadly, I don't think um, anything has, has uh, improved um, in the time that I've been here. It's interesting when you mentioned Sandra Day O'Connor, this is a little different, but I remember recently I was shocked to learn that I think cancer was not mentioned in the US in the 1950s. And if somebody died of cancer in the 1950s, they wouldn't even use the word in the obituary in the New York Times. It was an unspoken thing, which is mm -hmm. exactly how it still remains in, in, in Japan, pretty much. So in so many ways, it is like the US a long, long time ago, except uh, as we've been saying, I don't think there's a, the prospect of um, of much change. So when you mention an ambitious woman in Japan, I think she would see herself more as an energetic woman who would therefore pour her energies into a different direction. And mm. I think almost the first quote you read was about the disjunction between people who are sitting impassively in a train and reading comic books that are full of emotion and very powerful block capitals. And I think that speaks for what we all sense, which is in proportion to the way in which the Japanese people, I think, are very self-controlled in public, they have the wildest hobbies in private, which they pursue 2,000% beyond any equivalent here. And so I think the women I know, I mean, again, it's a presumptuous generalization, but I think they've got lots and lots of energy and they've lots and lots of you know, intellectual engagement. And so they'll just use all their free time to go all out pursuing you know, reading every book by Emily Bronte or <laughs> learning Russian or doing something or other, knowing that they aren't allowed much scope in the public domain, but in the private domain, they have even more free time than the men really to pursue something 
um, all out. Uh, my wife, when she was traveling, when she was meeting her high school friends yesterday, said one of them, as they were walking around a Japanese shrine, suddenly started speaking in English for no good reason with two Japanese friends. And I think that's because her hobby is languages. And so she not being able to not encouraged to be a professor or to work in an international company, learns lots of languages, travels when she can, and even when she's talking to her oldest Japanese friends, will throw in French and English because that's her her hobby. But it's a it's a very serious hobby. Hobby is not something just for a couple of hours a week, but they can make it several hours a day in yeah. in many instances and take it seriously. And, um, Very, I, you know, yes. I, I, I was going to, I have to ask you this because I was thinking about this earlier in the conversation and I know there will, I would imagine be people who will listen to this, who are interested in Japan and maybe uh, have fallen in love with the country and would love to mimic some of Pico Iyer's life and spend, you know, more time in the country. And you, you talked earlier about the visa. This is not related to the book. Mm-hmm. It's a more logistical question about your life. And you talked about the the visa that that you've been on for years. How does that work? So you you've never become a citizen. How are you able to you know, legally stay in the country for as long as you have? So um, carrying a U.S. or British passport every time I arrive. This is what you experienced, I'm sure. I'm allowed to stay for ninety days. And given the nature of my job, which involves constant movement, and many events in the United States and a mother who lives in the United States, I'm never here for more than 90 days anyway. In fact, I'm usually here for you know, 20 or 25 days at a time. Mm-hmm. So it's it's never been a problem. And I think mm-hmm. you know, I'm putting money into the Japanese system. I'm not taking anything out of Japan. Um, and so, so far, the government has been very kind and indulgent towards me. Um, when I first arrived here, a lot of people would um, teach English which is a very easy, a good, easy way to, to live in Japan. They're not the most exciting of jobs. And a lot of people in those days would kind of find a way to work around the system whereby they do something sort of semi-illegally here. And then every 88 days, they'd go take the boat to South Korea, to Busan and then come back and be eligible for another 90 days. I don't know if that's possible now and probably not advisable, but um Japan, you know, needs needs foreign workers, and they're more inclined to take them from the U.S. than from um, the impoverished parts of Asia. So mm-hmm. it's certainly not a closed country in in that regard. Um, in my case, it's I'm, I'm the only person who chooses to live like that, precisely for the reason I don't want to live in Japan. Oh, sorry, I don't want to work in Japan. I don't want mm-hmm. to be part of the working world because my romance with Japan might fade if I were, and also. My bosses and and colleagues and obligations are all in the U.S. and and England. And I'm so grateful for technology that allows me to sit in my little apartment in Japan and still send articles and books off to my bosses in New York City. Yeah. And so as long as you leave the country, if I'm hearing you correctly, every 90 days and you come, you're good. It's worked out for you for all these years. Yes. And I will say that during the pandemic, when the whole country closed very dramatically for two and a half years, each time I wanted to return, I had to apply for a visa and it was very, very difficult to get. Mm -hmm. But I should also say, and you will appreciate this now in Japan, that the people in the Japanese consulate in Los Angeles, as I was bombarding them with long letters, were so gracious and bending over backwards to to make things easy for me and mm-hmm. to try and accommodate my needs. And then would even put little smiley faces in the emails that they sent to me, even as consular officials. And so sweet. So I always felt they're really on my side. And if it's at all possible, they're going to make sure I can get back to Japan. So I was very touched by their kindness in difficult circumstances. And they kept on issuing me every few weeks a new visa to get that was unusual and i think most people were finding it impossible to return but um it was just a reminder of how even uh, in the most forbidding offices in japan you run into a sweetness and a grace that i never expect to find in any other culture yeah grace was the word that kept coming to mind as well as we were talking about so many of these qualities yes here here are a few more that i want to read and then there's a final theme i would love to get your your thoughts on uh, sure. And you alluded to this earlier uh, about um, the English proficiency, proficiency and how low it is in Japan. And this is a quote about uh, North Korea. And this is it. In North Korea, I'm regularly startled to encounter a hermit kingdom where a leader is taken to be God. Everyone marches to the beat of a single drummer and mass chants and calisthenics are daily enforced to remind everyone 
of collective responsibility. My neighbors in what for more than two centuries was itself a hermit kingdom tend not to think of most of this as strange. When they were young, they saw Japanese policemen arrest citizens for going to the movies, drinking coffee, or eating sweet potatoes in the street. It's not North Korea's unbending upholding of order that unsettles my friends in Japan. It's their neighbor's indifference to boundaries. Such a deep insight there. Here's another one. In Victorian times, while the Grand Tour was flourishing, a Japanese man could be executed for trying to leave Japan, and a foreign vessel landing in Japan would be destroyed, and all its cargoes, all its cargo and passengers slaughtered. The, com- the computer company Apple Inc. has sometimes seemed to be almost Japanese, not because of its sleekly minimalistic designs or because of Steve Jobs' delight in the walled gardens of Kyoto, to which he took each of his children, but simply because it has maintained its perfection by operating within a tightly controlled, closed system. It remakes the world by keeping most of that world out. And here are just a few more. What is the best thing about Japanese culture? This is a question you ask. Silence, he says, as he closes the door and rolls down the window. It's a silent world. Here's another one. From the age of nine, Ichiro Suzuki admitted he had taken by his father he had he had been taken by his father to a batting cage every day for four hours from the age of seven. He had five to six hours in a year to play with friends. Sometimes Japan seems more than ready to change itself on the surface, precisely so it so that it never has to change deep down. And this is a guy, a quote from Kevin Kelly, who it sounds like is a friend. I just interviewed Kevin uh, a couple of weeks ago about a new book he has coming out later this year about uh, wisdom. And this is the quote, and this is from the book, and this is a quote from, Kel- from Kevin. I traveled around Japan these last three years, says my friend, the techno visionary Kevin Kelly, and I never saw a single broken roof tile, not one. On the other hand, I didn't see much new construction. Maintenance. That's what Japan does. And the final quote I'd love to read, and the theme of this uh, is baseball. And I, I get the sense that you would agree with this, that baseball as an event is um, a kind of a microcosm of much that is Japanese. At least going to Japanese baseball games seems to be that. And here's the quote. In a country by every measure at least six times safer than the United States, an umpire from the States was prevented from working games in Japan, writes the leading American expert on Japanese baseball, Robert Whiting, on the grounds that it was, quote, not safe to umpire in Japan. You talk about baseball quite a bit, and I think I've heard you say this, that for any foreigner that just has a few days in the country, your top recommendation for them would be to go and would be to go and, and see a baseball game. Um, yes. You, Even though the baseball games, I would say, are much more boring here than in the US, but the audience participation is much more exciting. Uh, and uh, we've been talking about how shy and, and courteous and reserved Japanese people are when you pass them on the street or when you're on the train with them. Get them in a baseball stadium and you're getting the most boisterous, gregarious, welcoming side of Japan. I mean, literally, you're you're part of the team there and uh, mm-hmm. grandmothers will offer you their little their, their fried octopus and uh, guys dressed from head to toe as bears will will hug you and it's a it's a wonderful experience um i took my wife to a dodgers game in los angeles recently and she couldn't believe it because it was you know a tied game in the eighth inning and everyone was heading out to get their super nachos (laughs) she said wait a minute this is the most exciting time why are they looking at everything other than the game because here um it's such intense participation and the book i often recommend to people when they're coming to japan is by robert whiting whom you mentioned called you gotta 
Fab Wa, where by looking at Japanese baseball, he explains so much about the, the cultural differences. Um, it's fascinating for me. There's a big change. When I came in the 1980s, Japan was the home of sort of washed up American baseball players who, is, instead of retiring, would come over here and just swinging in the small stadiums would get 60 home runs in a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I never guessed then that very soon it would be Otani and Ichiro and Nomo and many others Japanese players actually taking over the major leagues. Um, to answer your deeper question, uh, which is a really good one, I will I will say you probably know this, but not all your listeners may. In 2019, I brought out two books on Japan at exactly the same time that were meant to be contradictory. This one we've been talking about, which, as you said at the outset, is an outsider's perspective, and another narrative book called Autumn Light, which is about living in a community, playing in a ping pong club, and being in a marriage and a Japanese family for 30 years, and sort of seeing it from the inside um, in the context of, of death and autumn and impermanence and all the great Japanese themes. And I think in the Autumn Light book, I point out that where you're talking to me right now, Dan, is um, it's a completely Western-style apartment in a completely Western suburb where even the streets are called a park dory and school dory, using the American terms. Um, speaking for the fact that it's mostly retired people, and when Japanese people retire, their dream is to live in some version of California. <laughs> so this looks like California, the suburb of Nara. But when you go to the center of Nara, the ancient capital from the 8th century, and I'll be going there this afternoon, right at the heart of Nara is the largest municipal park in Japan. Mm. Temples and shrines, uh, sutra houses, plum groves, beautiful, everything associated with ancient Japan. And 1,200 wild deer who pretty Mm. much rule the downtown. You go to the city hall and you'll find in front of this big glass and concrete building deer sitting on the front steps. You go to the fanciest hotel, no doorman, there were doe standing at the uh, at the uh, at the front. And it speaks to my sense of what Japan is like, which is, as, as we've been saying a couple of times, very Western, post-war, even mock Californian on, on the surface, and deep down 8th century Japan that hasn't changed at all, and therefore endlessly mysterious and and different and and intriguing. Um, I I think I describe in the book, Japan to me is a bit like an old man in a Planet Hollywood t-shirt. So it's cool, it's global Mm -hmm. up up to the minute, but it's still old and it's still Mm -hmm. Japanese and it's still speaking a different language in every way, literally and metaphorically from the rest of the world, Um, which is why it's such a tremendous place to to visit. I can't think of a richer place to visit because, as we've been saying, as you said at the beginning, so foreign in some ways, but so comforting and friendly and and kind and familiar in in other ways. And I think I find if you're looking for a home or a job or a partner, one's always looking for that mix of familiarity and foreignness. The foreignness keeps you interested and the familiarity keeps you calm, as it were. And Japan, for me, is just the perfect blend of both those qualities. Yeah, very well said. And uh, I know know our time is up, but I want to reiterate just how much I love this book and love your work. And I come back to it often. I, in many ways, I think it can be informative about, you know, what we all might be able to learn from the Japanese. And maybe it makes sense in, in closing the conversation. I, I, I hope I, we get to meet at some point in, in person, but I, I'd love to close by maybe asking you if there's anything else about the country that we haven't you know mentioned that, that you love, that you think is worth talking about i was mentioning that i talked to kevin kelly recently and his book is about wisdom and uh, you know so much to me about what we can learn from the japanese is is about wisdom um so anything else that if there is anything else you'd like to add about what you love about the place or what else we might be able to learn that we haven't talked about from the japanese that would make our culture you know richer more sane more beautiful i'd, I'd love to hear when people ask me why I live in Japan, my one word answer is kindness. And I've been lucky to visit most of the countries on the planet and to meet kindness almost everywhere. But I've never found a degree of thoughtfulness and thinking about the other um, so pronounced and so universal as in Japan. And the example I often use is if you visit um, a Japanese person's home for tea and, and she give, and she says, what kind do you like? And you have Earl Grey tea. You choose Earl Grey tea. If you visit 10 years later, she'll have the Earl Grey tea waiting for you. Mm-hmm. Um, 
because her attention is entirely on what you want, what makes you comfortable, um, what what's your preference, not on insisting on on hers. And that's a rare grace to use the word we've been using and gift to meet anywhere. Uh, Monocle, the the cool global magazine that I think is a very good register of what's going on across the world. Um, a few years ago, named Japan the friendliest country on earth. And I was really happy about that because Mm -hmm. even though people are shy about their English and even though they're reserved and even though it's foreign, I think you find me to friendliness here that's innocent and sweet and and genuine and really, really touching. And the main story I hear, I hear two stories from my friends who visit. The first is they get lost in Tokyo and they meet someone who can barely speak English, but that person will go two hours out of her way to make sure they're safely back at their hotel. Um, And everybody has some variation on that story. And the other story I always hear from people who come here on vacation is they go to a convenience store and they buy their French fries and they walk out and it starts to rain and the convenience store cash register person will run after them in the rain to give them an umbrella free because they want to make sure they don't get wet. And it, it sounds like something out of fantasy, but really does happen here. And it's not something you expect to happen um, many other places. So um, I love your stress on what we can learn from Japan, because it's such a different place. It's easy to come here and knock your f- fist against the wall and say, why isn't it working on American terms? Why is everything so different? Why don't they speak English? And I think much more productive, is, as you said, um, what do we have to learn from them and, and what do they have to learn from us? I think mm-hmm. my Japanese wife would say she has many things that she's eager to learn from the US, but we certainly have things to learn from them. And I think that if you come to Japan with that spirit, um, your trip will be even richer than it would be otherwise, and it will anyway be so rich. I'm so glad the world has discovered Japan. 20 years ago, none of my friends wanted to come because they thought it was so foreign, forbidding and expensive. Um, and now it's much more English friendly than it used to be. And people have found um, what a welcoming place it is. So yeah. it's not exactly an answer to your question, but please. It well, it just seems like a place so deep in empathy that, yes. they, that, 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 that quality, which is, you know, it, it can be in short supply in this world is, is very much there. And I have to imagine maybe if I, if I can sneak in one final question with, with you, Am I right that it it's it just is infectious? You know, being around that kind of grace, that kind of those kind of manners, that kind of thoughtfulness that it rubs off on you. Has that been your experience? I I really hope so, and 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 I think so very much. And I notice when I'm back in the U.S., I talk much less <laughs> than I used to. I try to listen much harder, and I try to incorporate that kind of attention. The word that keeps on coming up to me, which is a variation on empathy, is consideration. Mm-hmm. And I, I know when we encounter politeness, some people see politeness as hypocrisy. Why are you not saying what you mean? But I see it as consideration, thinking about you and your difficult life and what will serve your needs most of all rather than rather than mine. Um, and the other thing that really strikes me is that all these qualities impressed me when I made brief trips to Japan. But now that I'm here, month after month after month, it never falters. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember ever going to a shop where there wasn't what I needed and things didn't work. Or I, I can't remember anybody saying no or anybody being rude. So mm. they can keep this up uh, forever, it, indefinitely. It's it's not just a face that people can put on for a few hours and then they, they show their true anger. I mean, people will say that the Japanese, when they're drunk, show you a different face and they'll t- tell you other things which are which are true. But nonetheless, in the public domain, um, the courtesy goes on un- un- uninterruptedly, which means that somehow, speaking of infectiousness, it's imparted to little kids at a very early age mm. to think about everybody else in front of themselves. And recently, I've been hearing a lot about how in Japanese schools there are no janitors because the kids are taught from the age of five to clean up after themselves and to clean up, in fact, after everybody else, as we witnessed mm. in the World Cup, too. And the cleanliness is really that speaks for a much larger thing about being responsible for everybody and everything, uh, and that your own little agenda or mission is much less important than the harmony of the whole. So I think of Japan as a symphony orchestra in which each person Mm. is playing her part and playing it perfectly so as to make this beautiful harmony, and that's one reason why they're a little unsettled by a foreigner or by somebody who's different who doesn't 
play an instrument and maybe can't read the music, um, mm. but it functions on its own terms um, beautifully. And, and empathy is a wonderful way of of putting it. Selflessness would be another way of putting it. Um, people, when I first arrived here, my first week here, a Californian person friend took me around, and he said, "You'll notice nobody's foisting their agenda or their their designs on you or their theories about the world. You know, people aren't talking about politics all the time." Um, but they are talking about the cherry blossoms because they know that the cherry blossoms bring us all together and the politics are only going to divide. So let's do something that's going to be conducive to a larger harmony and happiness. Yeah, there is something to that. And I think we all could could uh, take a page out of the Japanese playbook on on that regard. Pico, I, I'm so honored and grateful that uh, you would take your precious time to do this and to have this conversation. It's It's been a real honor for me. Uh, I think I've said this five or six times. I love this book. And um, I think for anybody who's interested in human nature and culture and just different places in the world, it's a, it's a wonderful place to start. So thank you for writing it. And thanks for giving me so much of your time. I, I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you, Dan. I mean, you can imagine what a great compliment and blessing it is for an author to actually have somebody so keen to read his sentences back to him. So thank you for taking the time to to read the book and think about it and share the sentences with your your listeners and i hope we get to meet in meet in person indeed in in japan likewise <laughs>